Folks, what is going on? Arm and Hammer here, and uh, yeah, today we're going to be talking about a few different things. But the uh, the very first thing we're going to get into that is going to be the Dubai CrossFit Championship. You probably didn't see that one coming. Well, the fact of the matter is, I just spoke with the uh, event organizers at uh, at the DCC, and they are thinking that they're not going to be able to put on this event this year. So it's scheduled for December. Uh, it, it would be for the 2021 CrossFit Games season. Um, they were really unique uh, and creative and completely changing up the format. I did a whole video on that and how they're going to do, you know, sort of like individual testing of, uh, of various sort of like, you know, uh, uh, dimensions of fitness. You know, there'd be a kettlebell thing and a strength thing and an endurance thing and a swimming thing and a running thing and a body weight thing, right? So they they had this really unique way of uh, of changing up how their event is run, and it's a little interesting to hear an event that is for the next CrossFit game season, an event that isn't scheduled to take place for seven months essentially deciding to pull the plug this early. And when I asked about why that is going to be the case, why they're actually, you know, moving in, in, in that direction, why they're, they're pretty sure it's not going to be happening. Uh, the answer was essentially about how uncertain everything is at this point. You know, there's so much uncertainty. There's, there's no real clear answer as to whether travel for international, uh, qualifiers are going to, to actually be allowed by either the, uh, the 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 government in Dubai or the rest of the governments from you know which the the competitors are going to be traveling from, um, and their qualifier was supposed to be taking place sometime over the next month or two, and that is clearly just not in the cards considering how many gyms are still closed, right? So. They just have a really rough path ahead of them to be able to say, yeah, we can successfully not only pull off a qualifier for our event, but we can actually successfully pull off the event itself. So it's a big bummer to hear that Dubai is, you know, basically locked down in sense that we're not going to be running the the DCC in December. But it's interesting in a, a couple different facets, specifically because how does this really affect the rest of the events that we're counting on coming back into play, you know, over the next seven, eight, nine months, right? If we're looking at an event that's scheduled in December and they aren't sure whether they're going to be able to pull off an event, what does that say for the rest of the events for the 2021 season that are going to be taking place in this calendar year? I mean, starting with, you know, Filthy 150 in November, they're in my opinion, probably the next event that's scheduled to take place that actually has a good chance of happening. Uh, Well, December is after November and Dubai is deciding not to do it. So where do the rest of these events lie? Like, you know, we can project out into the future and say that it seems like things are starting to open up again, but is international travel really going to be available are athletes going to be able to participate in online qualifiers? Are events going to be able to sustain themselves financially if they're not able to sell thousands of tickets for spectators to show up or vendor packages for exhibitors to be there on site? It's a really, really interesting and challenging position to be in. I don't know what the answer is going to be for any of those questions I do know that it's a bit of a red flag to see an event that is scheduled for seven months from now, essentially pulling the plug and just saying, hey, guys, we're not sure we can pull off a good event. In fact, we're so confident that we won't be able to pull off the right event, especially with all the changes that we had to the format this year, that we're going to call it this early. So the next thing we're going to be talking about, folks, is something that you've probably already heard of, which is the fact that the age groups have been, you know, kind of cut from the program when it comes to the 2020 CrossFit Games. And the, the 2020 Games have already had such a roller coaster year. You know, it, we were coming off of a very strange uh, 2019 season. The 2020 season was shaping up to be a, a real sort of jump in maturity in this whole sanctionals format. 
then all the sanctionals essentially got canceled or postponed. I would be shocked if we saw a sanction event happen between now and when the games are scheduled for uh, the, the beginning of August. CrossFit in classic CrossFit fashion is like going against all the trends and all the behavior of every other, you know, similar sports league or event even and committing to actually holding a competition, competing, committing to actually holding an event in person in August at Aromas at the CrossFit Ranch, you know, the logistics of that. I've talked about that in the past. I mean, just the logistics of putting people together in that place at the same time from around the world is almost insurmountable. Like the the problems created just by saying you're going to do that are almost insurmountable to begin with. And, you know, part of solving some of those insurmountable problems is making tough decisions. Like, for example, cutting the age groups from the competition. Now, someone asked me before this got announced, someone asked me, uh, you know, what, what my expectation was. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's, uh, controversial to say that the first thing on the, on the chopping block would be the age groups and probably right after that would be the teams. But I would say it's a little less likely that the teams are completely cut, uh, for a variety of reasons, but neither here nor there the the idea that the age groups are getting cut is not or should not really be surprising you know we saw last year the age groups weren't even broadcast it wasn't even part of the plan to broadcast the age groups and they've been slowly sort of like pushed further and further into uh you know irrelevance isn't the right term, but it's the direction it's trending in, you know, and the age groups, uh, make up a really large percentage of the participation. Now I had a discussion with Justin LaFranco with the morning chalk up yesterday, where we talked a little bit about the, uh, participation of the age groups in the open. And they actually published a story on this essentially showing that it's a 50, 50 split from the 2020 CrossFit games open. It was about 50%. Um, you know, give or take, I think it was like 0.2%. It was like 50.2% were in the open division, the, 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 uh, the largest division, right? And then 49.8% were in one of the age groups and the teens are essentially a drop in the bucket. So the teens don't really count, right? There aren't enough of them to really make that big of a difference, which means that nearly half of the participants in the 2020 open were, in the master's age groups, 35 and up. And if you look at it from a sport and financial perspective, the question needs to be asked, uh, if the open is paying for the games, right? Let's say it, you had, you, had, you know, let's say for just ease of math, let's say you have, uh, 400,000 people participating. Each of them is giving $20. That's $8 million, right? So, if you have $8 million in the pool to pay for something like the games, half of that is coming from people in the master's division. Is half of that budget being spent on the master's? No, absolutely not. Not even close. And that's a rhetorical question, obviously. Should half of that be spent on the master's? No, of course it shouldn't be spent on master's. You know why? No one is watching the master's. And it's sad but it's true. The masters are really inspiring. They fit within the CrossFit health narrative incredibly well. They're representative of a much larger portion of the population that should be participating in this whole CrossFit thing at various affiliates. It fits exceptionally well into the storyline that we're trying to sell when it comes to CrossFit and CrossFit health and its accessibility. However, no one watches the Masters as a sport for the entertainment value of it because the games have always been, and CrossFit's been very crystal clear about this, focused on one thing and one thing only. They want to find number one. That's it. 
That's all they're looking for. They just want to find number one. They want to find the fittest male and the fittest female. It doesn't matter to them whether 10th place is the correct 10th fittest person on earth. That's not the that's not the claim they're making. The claim they're making is we found number one. The, the divisions for the teens and the masters have always been secondary to that. You're finding number one within this division. So it's more of like a participatory thing in the grand scheme of the CrossFit games. Whether or not that's the way it should be is, you know, not really relevant to the fact that that's the way it has been. And in terms of creating an entertaining sport, you're much more likely to find an entertaining product when you're just talking about number one and number one, not necessarily the masters or, you know, different divisions. Even the team division, honestly, is not that exciting to watch compared to the individual's division. And until we had someone like Rich move from the individual to the team and create this whole storyline in the team division, the team division was just like the math, like it was only being watched because it happened to be taking place on the same floor at the same time. When CrossFit decided to separate where the team division uh, and the individual division competitions take place, those things are smushed together. And then the masters are all sequestered in a different arena and don't ever really interact with where the individuals and the teams are competing. That was kind of like the first step in a very clear series of steps that uh, you know, ma- basically makes like a JV league when it comes to competing in CrossFit. And again, y- you're hearing me say things that are maybe a little bit inflammatory. I'm not saying that it's not impressive or valuable or that people, you know, should probably be more interested in it. What I'm saying is this is the way it is. So when the age groups are removed from competing at the games, especially in a year like this, it's not a surprise. However, there is a bright side to this. There is, there is, there is a silver lining to this. Uh, the silver lining is that it is an opportunity for other organizations to step up and create something for the age groups to compete in. Again, I'm not super confident we're going to see any in-person competitions for months. I mean, even the games to me are like really questionable, especially with how hard they're trying to put it on. It's very questionable whether it actually happens in person. However, the opportunity for different organizations to step in and be like, hey guys, we're going to create a master's competition. You know, if you earned your spot, you can come in. You've already basically qualified. We're going to use the existing qualifiers, blah, 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 blah. Right. We'll have some spectators, sponsors, prize money. I don't know. In fact, uh, Morning Shock Up just put out an article today about the team division and how it's probably the next thing to go. Uh, but a little side note of that article is that mayhem is planning a team competition at mayhem sometime around the CrossFit games. So there's already this sort of like backup to the competition. And if you look at how the mayhem classic went down in January, their entire their their, they really set themselves up for success in a situation like this because their entire model was based around broadcast as opposed to in-person fans. So if they have to hold an event with 9, 10, 12 teams or whatever, they can just broadcast it. The same thing that they did in January. They don't need to have 10,000 people buy tickets to show up to pay for it. And so there's kind of a precedent there of this is a model that could be scaled into the sort of new reality of competitive sports and it can be used to serve the demographic that has been criminally underserved by CrossFit up until this point, the masters and the teens, right? Not having a broadcast last year was a pretty big kick to the gut. 
this year, not having the competition at all, just sort of postponing it off to 2021, that's a pretty big kick to the gut too. And if someone can step up and put together a a spectator-friendly competition in this very strange time that we live in, that could probably succeed. It might not succeed to like, you know, you're not going to be making a million dollars off it, but you could probably make a decent event that serves that community both from the competitive standpoint and the spectator standpoint. At the end of the day, it's it's weird times. It's a strange, strange situation we find ourselves in. I still am having trouble wrapping my head around the sort of contradictory nature of CrossFit's like sudden and aggressive attachment to pulling off the CrossFit games after what happened last year with the game season. I, I'm I'm not 100% sure where or how it's all going to pan out. I mean, I don't know if anybody is at this point. I know that they're working very hard to actually pull it off. And I know that there's a lot of people who are invested emotionally and you know physically and financially in it happening uh, and it being a success. And I know that there's a huge positive to having stuff like this for people to watch and interact with and be a part of all of those things I think you can't argue against them those are those that's just the way it is that's just a fact you know the other side of it is like aromas the ranch it's in California the most probably draconic state when it comes to all these rules about which, Businesses are allowed to open. How many people can be avail- available to be at the same place at the same time? You know how they're gonna be monitoring whether they completely lock everything back down again. And it's like there's no certainty. There's nothing you can bet on, and it really is a huge risk to to put all of this effort, all of this time, all of this money, all of this movement and energy into something that has a really strong potential to just not pan out. A really strong potential to not pan out. And the upside of it actually happening is what? The upside of it happening is we have an event that is, you know, fun and cool and like a few dozen people compete at and they crown the fittest on earth. I I'm I'm not I don't know, guys. I don't know. I have I'm having a real hard time wrapping my head around the ins and outs of the situation. Maybe I'm completely missing something, but either way, uh, you know, if I am, let me know, you know, maybe, maybe I'm completely off base here. Uh, do not hesitate to let me know. You never do, but especially in this time, do not hesitate to let me know. Thank you so much, folks. I appreciate it. I'll see you guys next time.